Chapter One of Ancient and Modern Celebrated Freethinkers by Charles Bradlaugh. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ancient and Modern Celebrated Freethinkers by Charles Bradlaugh. Chapter One Thomas Hobbes. This distinguished freethinker was born on the 5th of April, 1588, at Malmesbury, hence his cognomen of the Philosopher of Malmesbury. In connection with his birth we are told that his mother, being a loyal Protestant, was so terrified at the rumored approach of the Spanish Armada that the birth of her son was hastened in consequence. The subsequent timidity of Hobbes is therefore easily accounted for. The foundation of his education was laid in the grammar school of his native town, where most probably his father, being a clergyman, would officiate as tutor. At the age of fifteen he was sent to Oxford. Five years of assiduous study made him proficient as a tutor. This, combined with his amiability and profound views of society, gained him the respect of the Earl of Devonshire and he was appointed tutor to the earl's son, Lord Cavendish. From 1610 to 1628 he was constantly in the society of this nobleman, in the capacity of secretary. In the interval of this time he travelled in France, Germany, and Italy, cultivating in each capital the society of the leading statesmen and philosophers. Lord Herbert of Cherbury, the first great English deist, and Ben Jonson, the dramatist, were each his boon companions. In the year 1628 Hobbes again made the tour of the continent for three years with another pupil, and became acquainted at Pisa with Galileo. In 1631 he was entrusted with the education of another youth of the Devonshire family, and for near five years remained at Paris with his pupil. Hobbes returned to England in 1636. The troublous politics of this age, with its strong party prejudices, made England the reverse of a pleasant retirement, for either Hobbes or his patrons. So, perceiving the outbreak of the revolution, he emigrated to Paris. There, in the enjoyment of the company of Gassendi and Descartes, with the elite of Parisian genius, he was for a while contented and happy. Here he engaged in a series of mathematical quarrels, which were prolonged throughout the whole of his life, on the quadrature of the circle. Seven years after, he was appointed mathematical tutor to the Prince of Wales, afterwards Charles II. In 1642 Hobbes published the first of his principal works, De Cive, or Philosophical Rudiments Concerning Government and Society. It was written to curb the spirit of anarchy, then so rampant in England, by exposing the inevitable results which must of necessity spring from the want of a coherent government amongst a people disunited and uneducated. The principles inculcated in this work were reproduced in the year 1651 in the Leviathan, or the matter, form, and power of a commonwealth ecclesiastical and civil. This, along with a treatise on human nature, and a small work on the body politic, form the groundwork of the selfish schools of moral philosophy. As soon as they were published, they were attacked by the clergy of every country in Europe. They were interdicted by the pontiffs of the Roman and Greek church, along with the Protestants scattered over Europe, and the episcopal authorities of England. Indeed, to such an extent did this persecution rise, that even the royalist exiles received warning that there was no chance for their ostracism being removed unless the unclean thing, Hobbes, was put away from their midst. The young prince, intimidated by those ebullitions of vengeance against his tutor, was obliged to withdraw his protection from him and the old man, then near seventy years of age, was compelled to escape from Paris by night, pursued by his enemies, who, according to Lord Clarendon, tracked his footsteps from France. Fortunately for Hobbes, he took refuge with his old protectors, the Devonshire family, who were too powerful to be wantonly insulted. 
while residing at chatsworth he would no doubt acutely feel the loss of descartes the cardinal de richelieu and gassendi in the place of those men he entered into a warm friendship with cowley the poet selden harvey the discoverer of the circulation of blood charles blunt and the witty sir thomas brown in sixteen fifty four he published a letter upon liberty and necessity this brief tractate is unsurpassed in freethought literature for its clear concise subtle and demonstrative proofs of the self-determining power of the will and the truth of philosophical necessity all subsequent writers on this question have largely availed themselves of hobbes arguments particularly the pamphleteers of socialism it is a fact no less true than strange that communism is derived from the system of hobbes which has always been classed along with that of machiavelli as an apology for despotism the grand peculiarity of hobbes is his method instead of taking speculation and reasoning upon theories he carried out the inductive system of bacon in its entirety reasoning from separate generic facts instead of analogically by this means he narrowed the compass of knowledge and made everything demonstrative that was capable of proof belief was consequently placed upon its proper basis and a rigid analysis separated the boundaries of knowing and being hobbes looked at the great end of existence and embodied it in a double axiom first the desire for self-preservation second to render ourselves happy from those duplex principles which are inherent in all animals a modern politician has perpetrated a platitude which represents in a sentence the end and aim of all legislation the greatest happiness for the greatest number this is the ultimatum of hobbes philosophy its method of accomplishment was by treating society as one large family with the educated and skilled as governors having under their care the training of the nation all acting from one impulse self-preservation and by the conjoint experience of all deriving the greatest amount of happiness from this activity hobbes opposed the revolution because it degenerated into a faction and supported charles stuart because there were more elements of cohesion within his own party than amongst his enemies it was here where the cry of despotism arose the roundheads seeing they could not detach the ablest men from the king's party denounced their literary opponents as lovers of belial and of tyranny this was their most effective answer to the leviathan in after years when the episcopal party no longer stood in need of the services of hobbes they heaped upon him the stigma of heresy until his sideviant friends and enemies were united in the condemnation of the man they most feared mr owen in his schema of socialism took his leading idea on non-responsibility from hobbes explanation of necessity and the freedom of the will the old divines had inculcated a doctrine to the effect that the will was a separate entity of the human mind which swayed the whole disposition and was of itself essentially corrupt ample testimony from the bible substantiated this position but in the method of hobbes he lays down the fact that we can have no knowledge without experience and no experience without sensation the mind therefore is composed of classified sensations united together by the law of an association of ideas this law was first discovered by hobbes who makes the human will to consist in the strongest motive which sways the balance on any side this is the simplest explanation which can be given on a subject more mystified than any other in theology a long controversy betwixt bishop bramhall of londonderry followed the publication of hobbes views on liberty and necessity charles the second on his restoration bestowed an annual pension of one hundred pounds on hobbes 
but this did not prevent the parliament in sixteen sixty six censuring the decive and leviathan besides his other works hobbes also translated the greek historian thucydides homer's odyssey and the iliad the last years of his life were spent in composing behemoth or a history of the civil wars from sixteen forty to sixteen sixty which was finished in the year he died but not published until after his death at the close of the year sixteen seventy nine he was taken seriously ill at the urgent request of some christians they were permitted to intrude their opinions upon his dying bed telling him gravely that his illness would end in death and unless he repented he would go straight to hell hobbes calmly replied i shall be glad then to find a hole to creep out of the world for seventy years he had been a persecuted man but during that time his enemies had paid him that tribute of respect which genius always extorts from society he was a man who was hated and dreaded he had reached the age of ninety-two when he died his words were pregnant with meaning and he never used an unnecessary sentence a collection of moral apothegms might be gathered from his table talk when asked why he did not read every new book which appeared he said if i had read as much as other men i should have been as ignorant his habits were simple he rose early in the morning took a long walk through the grounds of chatsworth and cultivated healthful recreation the after part of the day was devoted to study and composition like sir walter raleigh he was a devoted admirer of the fragrant herb charles the second's constant witticism styled hobbes as a bear against whom the church played their young dogs in order to exercise them if there had been a few more similar bears the priestly dogs would long since have been exterminated for none of them escaped unhurt from their encounters with the grizzly of malmesbury except it was in the mathematical disputes of dr wallace he was naturally of a timid disposition this was the result of the accident which caused his premature birth and being besides of a reserved character he was ill-fitted to meet the physical rebuffs of the world it is said that he was so afraid of his personal safety that he objected to be left alone in an empty house this charge is to some extent true but we must look to the mitigating circumstances of the case he was a feeble man, turned the age of threescore and ten, with all the clergy of England hounding on their dupes to murder an old philosopher, because he had exposed their dogmas. It was but a few years before that Protestants and Papists had complimented each other's religion by burning those who were the weakest, and long after Hobbes' death protestants murdered ruined disgraced and placed in the pillory dissenters and catholics alike and thomas hobbes had positive proof that it was the intention of the church of england to burn him alive on the stake a martyr for his opinions this then is a sufficient justification for hobbes feeling afraid and instead of it being thrown as a taunt at this illustrious freethinker it is a standing stigma on those who would re-enact the tragedy of persecution if public opinion would allow it sir james mackintosh says the style of hobbes is the very perfection of didactic language short clear precise pithy his language never has more than one meaning which never requires a second thought to find by the help of his exact method it takes so firm a hold on the mind that it will not allow attention to slacken his little tract on human nature has scarcely an ambiguous or a needless word he has so great a power of always choosing the most significant term that he never is reduced to the poor expedient of using many in its stead he had so thoroughly studied the genius of the language and knew so well how to steer between pedantry and vulgarity that two centuries have not superannuated probably more than a dozen of his words from the second dissertation encyclopedia britannica page three eighteen lord clarendon describes the personal character of hobbes as 
one for whom he always had a great esteem as a man, who besides his eminent parts of learning and knowledge, hath been always looked upon as a man of probity, and a life free from scandal. We now proceed to make a selection of quotations from the works of this writer, commencing with those on the necessity of the will, in reply to Bishop Bramhall. The question is not whether a man be a free agent, that is to say, whether he can write or forbear, speak or be silent, according to his will, but whether the will to write and the will to forbear come upon him according to his will or according to anything else in his own power. I acknowledge this liberty that I can do if I will, but to say I can will if I will, I take to be an absurd speech. Further replying to Bramhall's argument that we do not learn the idea of the freedom of the will from our tutors, but we know it intuitively, Hobbes says, it is very true few have learned from tutors that a man is not free to will, nor do they find it much in books. That they, and in books that which the poets chaunt in the theatres and the shepherds on the mountains, that which the pastors teach in the churches and the doctors in the universities, and that which the common people in the markets and all the people do assent to, is the same that I assent to namely, that a man hath freedom to do if he will, but whether he hath freedom to will is a question which it seems neither the bishop nor they ever thought of. A wooden top that is lashed by the boys, and runs about, sometimes to one wall, sometimes to another, sometimes spinning, sometimes hitting men on the shins, if it were sensible of its own motion, would think it proceeded from its own will unless it felt what lashed it. And is a man any wiser when he runs to one place for a benefice, to another for a bargain, and troubles the world with writing errors and requiring answers, because he thinks he does it without other cause than his own will, and seeth not what are the lashings which cause that will? Hobbes casually mentions the subject of praise or dispraise in his reference to the will. Those who are old enough will remember this was one of the most frequent subjects of discussion amongst the earlier socialists. These depend not at all in the necessity of the action praised or dispraised, for what is it else to praise but to say a thing is good? Good, I say, for me, or for somebody else, or for the state and commonwealth. And what is it to say an action is good, but to say it is as I would wish, or as another would have it, or according to the will of the state, that is to say, according to the law? Does my lord think that no action could please me or the commonwealth that should proceed from necessity? Things may be therefore necessary, and yet praiseworthy, and also necessary, and yet dispraised, and neither of them both in vain, because praise and dispraise, and likewise reward and punishment, do by example make and conform the will to good or evil. It was a very great praise, in my opinion, that Valerius Paterculus gives Cato, when he says that he was good by nature, et qui alater est non potui, and because he could not do otherwise. This able treatise was reprinted and extensively read about twenty years ago, but, like many other of our standard works, is at present out of print. The Leviathan is still readable, a bold masculine book. It treats everything in a cool, analytical style. The knife of the socialist is sheathed in vain. No rhapsody can overturn its impassioned teachings. Rhetoric is not needed to embellish the truths he has to portray, for the wild flowers of genius but too frequently hide the yawning chasms in the garden of logic. It is not to be expected that this book will be read now with the interest with which it was perused two centuries ago. Then every statement was impugned, every argument denied, and the very tone of the book called forth an interference from Parliament to stop the progress of its heresies. 
now the case is widely different and the general tenor of the treatise is the rule in which are illustrated alike the works of the philosophers and the dreams of the sophists priests we give part of the introduction nature the art whereby god hath made and governs the world is by the art of man as in many other things so in this also imitated that it can make an artificial animal for seeing life is but a motion of limbs the beginning whereof is in some principal part within why may we not say that all automata engines that move themselves by springs and wheels as doth a watch have an artificial life for what is the heart but a spring and the nerves but so many strings and the joints but so many wheels giving motion to the whole body such as was intended by the artificer art goes yet further imitating that rational and most excellent work of nature man for by art is created that great leviathan called a commonwealth or state which is but an artificial man though of greater stature and strength than the natural for whose protection and defence it was intended and the sovereignty of which is an artificial soul as giving life and motion to the whole body to describe the nature of this artificial man i will consider first the matter therefore and the artificer both which is man second how and by what covenants it is made what are the rights and just power of authority of a sovereign and what it is that preserveth and dissolveth it third what is a christian commonwealth lastly what is the kingdom of darkness the first chapter treats of senses concerning the thoughts of man i will consider them first singly and afterwards in train or dependence upon one another singly they are every one a representation or appearance of some quality or accident of a body without us which is commonly called an object which object worketh on the eyes ears and other parts of a man's body and by diversity of working produceth diversity of appearances the original of them all is that which we call sense for there is no conception in a man's mind which hath not at first totally or by parts been begotten unto the organs of sense the rest are derived from that original speaking of imagination hobbes says that when a thing lies still unless somewhat else stir it it will lie still forever is a truth no one doubts of but that when a thing is in motion it will eternally be in motion unless somewhat else stay it though the reason be the same namely that nothing can change itself is not so easily assented to for men measure not only other men but all other things by themselves and because they find themselves subject after motion to pain and lassitude think everything else grows weary of motion and seeks repose of its own accord little considering whether it be not some other motion wherein that desire of rest they find in themselves consisteth when a body is once in motion it moveth unless something else hinder it eternally and whatsoever hindereth it cannot in an instant but in time and by degrees quite extinguish it and as we see in the water though the wind cease the waves give not over rolling for a long time after so also it happeneth in that motion which is made of the internal parts of man then when he sees dreams etc for after the object is removed or the eye shut we still retain an image of the thing seen though more obscure than when we see it the decay of sense in men waking is not the decay of the motion made in sense but an obscuring of it in such manner as the light of the sun obscureth the light of the stars which stars do no less exercise their virtue by which they are visible in the day than in the night 
but because amongst many strokes which our eyes ears and other organs receive from external bodies the predominant only is sensible therefore the light of the sun being only predominant we are not affected with the actions of the stars this decaying sense when we would express the thing itself i mean fancy itself we call imagination as i said before but when we would express the decay and signify the senses fading old and past it is called memory so that imagination and memory are but one thing which for diverse considerations hath diverse names such is the commencement of this celebrated book it is based upon materialism every argument must stand this test upon hobbes principles and characteristically are they elaborated hobbes deceive says of the immortality of the soul it is a belief grounded upon other men's sayings that they knew it supernaturally or that they knew those who knew them that knew others that knew it supernaturally a sparkling sneer and perhaps the truest answer to so universal an error dugald stuart in his analysis of the works of hobbes says the fundamental doctrines inculcated in the political works of hobbes are contained in the following propositions all men are by nature equal and prior to government they had all an equal right to enjoy the good things of this world man too is by nature a solitary and purely selfish animal the social union being entirely an interested league suggested by prudential views of personal advantage the necessary consequence is that a state of nature must be a state of perpetual warfare in which no individual has any other means of safety than his own strength or ingenuity and in which there is no room for regular industry because no secure enjoyment of its fruits in confirmation of this view of the origin of society hobbes appeals to facts falling daily within the cycle of our experience does not a man he asks when taking a journey arm himself and seek to go well accompanied when going to sleep does he not lock his doors nay even in his own house does he not lock his chests does he not there accuse mankind by his actions as i do by my words for the sake of peace and security it is necessary that each individual should surrender a part of his natural right and be contented with such a share of liberty as he is willing to allow to others or to use hobbes own language every man must divest himself of the right he has to all things by nature the right of all men to all things being in effect no better than if no man had a right to anything in consequence of this transference of natural rights to an individual or to a body of individuals the multitude become one person under the name of a state or republic by which person the common will and power are exercised for the common defence the ruling power cannot be withdrawn from those to whom it has been committed nor can they be punished for misgovernment the interpretation of the laws is to be sought not from the comments of philosophers but from the authority of the ruler otherwise society would every moment be in danger of resolving itself into the discordant elements of which it was first composed the will of the magistrate therefore is to be regarded as the ultimate standard of right and wrong and his voice to be listened to by every citizen as the voice of conscience leviathan edition sixteen fifty one from the dissertation on the progress of ethical science page forty one such are the words of one of hobbes most powerful opponents dr warburton says the philosopher of malmesbury was the terror of the last age as tyndall and collins are of this the press sweats with controversy and every young churchman militant would try his arms in thundering on hobbes steel cap this is a modest acknowledgment of the power of hobbes from the most turbulent divine of the eighteenth century victor comian gives the following as his view of the philosophy of hobbes 
there is no other certain evidence than that of the senses the evidence of the senses attests only the existence of bodies then there is no existence save that of bodies and philosophy is only the science of bodies there are two sorts of bodies first natural bodies which are the theatre of a multitude of regular phenomena because they take place by virtue of fixed laws as the bodies with which physics are occupied second moral and political bodies societies which constantly change and are subject to variable laws hobbes system of physics is that of democritus the atomistic and corpuscular of the ionic school his metaphysics are its corollary all the phenomena which pass in the consciousness have their source in the organization of which the consciousness in itself is simply a result all the ideas come from the senses to think is to calculate and the intelligence is nothing else than an arithmetic as we do not calculate without signs we do not think without words the truth of the thought is in the relation of the words among themselves and metaphysics are reduced to a perfect language hobbes is completely a nominalist with hobbes there are no other than contingent ideas the finite alone can be conceived the infinite is only a negation of the finite beyond that it is a mere word invented to honor a being whom faith alone can reach the idea of good and evil has no other foundation than agreeable or disagreeable sensations to agreeable or disagreeable sensation it is impossible to apply any other law than escape from the one and search after the other hence the morality of hobbes which is the foundation of his politics man is capable of enjoying and of suffering his only law is to suffer as little and enjoy as much as possible since such is his only law he has all the rights that this law confers upon him he may do anything for his preservation and his happiness he has the right to sacrifice everything to himself behold then men upon this earth where the objects of desire are not superabundant all possessing equal rights to whatever may be agreeable or useful to them by virtue of the same capacity for enjoyment and suffering this is a state of nature which is nothing less than a state of war the anarchy of the passions a combat in which every man is arrayed against his neighbor but this state being opposed to the happiness of the majority of individuals who share it utility the offspring of egotism itself demands its exchange for another to wit the social state the social state is the institution of a public power stronger than all individuals capable of making peace succeed war and imposing on all the accomplishment of whatever it shall have judged to be useful that is just before we dismiss the father of free thought from our notice there remains a tribute of respect to be paid to one whom it is our duty to associate with the author of the leviathan and who has but just passed away one man amongst the british aristocracy with the disposition of a tribune of the people coupled with thoughts at once elevated and free and a position which rendered him of essential service to struggling opinion this man saw the greatness the profound depth the attic style and the immense importance of the works of hobbes along with their systematic depreciation by those whose duty it should be to explain them especially at a time when those works were not reprinted and the public were obliged to glean their character from the refutations so called by mangled quotations and a distorted meaning impelled by this thought and anxious to protect the memory of a philosopher his devoted disciple at a cost of ten thousand pounds translated the latin and edited the english works of hobbes in a manner noteworthy alike of the genius of the author and the discernment of his editor for this kindness a seat in parliament was lost by the organization of the clergy in cornwall the name of this man was sir william molesworth let freethinkers cherish the memory of their benefactor 
we now take our leave of thomas hobbes he had not the chivalry of herbert the vivacity of raleigh the cumulative power of bacon or the winning policy of locke if his physical deformities prevented him from being as daring as vain he was as bold in thought and expression as either descartes or his young friend blount he gave birth to the brilliant constellation of genius in the time of queen anne he did not live to see his system extensively promulgated but his principles moulded the character of the men who formed the revolution of sixteen eighty eight equally as much as hume established the scotch and german schools of philosophy and voltaire laid the train by which the french revolution was proclaimed peace to his memory it was a stormy struggle during his life its frowns cannot hurt him now could we believe in the idea of a future life we should invoke his blessings on our cause that cause which for near two hundred years has successfully struggled into birth to youth and maturity striking down in its onward course superstitions which hath grown with centuries and where it does not exterminate them it supplies a purer atmosphere and extracts the upper sting which has laid low so many and which must yet be finally exterminated the day is rapidly dawning when our only deities will be the works of genius and our only prayer the remembrance of our most illustrious chiefs end of section one of ancient and modern celebrated freethinkers by charles bradlaugh read for you by ted delorme